All right, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here to give this talk about the resurgence of ILT. And hopefully we'll touch on some topics that are very uh, appropriate for this uh, eBeam uh, audience. So I'm Tom Cecil. I'm from Synopsys, a principal engineer there, and worked on ILT and other RET techniques uh, there and previously at Luminescent. So for this talk, what I will talk about is give a little ILT overview, just some basics about what we do with ILT and some of the mask manufacturability issues that there are. Uh, we'll talk, also talk about some current use cases that are being used by our customers, and then some future extensions and things that are being requested uh, more recently. Okay, so first I'll give a couple items about why do we need ILT? So one of the main drivers for the use of ILT is the source shape. So for an example here, we have a pretty simple design, which is just a couple of 1D arrays. And then we've treated those with multiple different source optimizations. We have something kind of like a stretched dipole. It's almost an annulus. We have a quad pole down here. And then we have something that is a freeform source, which has really been optimized so that the mask is very simple. And so you can see that, depending on your source shape, you have somewhat different assist feature treatments and probably some unintuitive uh, result for the process window performance, where you can see that even this simple source can get a very good uh, wide focus range here. And so the most complex source, even with a very simple mask, can still do OK and better than a complex mask. So the reason I'm showing this is that there's a lot of non-intuitive things that are happening that are hard to uh, usually handle with the typical OPC and RBF solutions, especially when the source is becoming more complicated. It doesn't necessarily mean the mask will become more complicated. So it's, there's some uh, complications there that really help for ILT to do a lot of computational work that maybe humans wouldn't be able to figure out so easily. Okay, second main reason for using ILT is the pattern dependence. So as things are shrinking, Really what we have is a lot of complicated interactions happening over the range of hundreds of nanometers, which can encompass multiple bands of assist features outside of the contacts. So here we have a small one by three array of contacts and some other random placement of some contacts. And what you can see here is that the placement of the assist features around what we may consider to be a somewhat isolated feature is sort of similar in that this feature and this feature have an, uh, or this uh, contact and this contact have an assist feature at the end. But after you get to about you know a little bit away, this second contact is really starting to augment what is happening with the assist features and changing this. And there's a lot of interaction even between here and here in terms of the second and third bands of assist features, which is really difficult to capture in a, a, a typical rule table for assist features. Also, we have different mask types that can cause a lot of complications. CPL or other high transmission. So CPL is a continuous phase lithography where basically you just have different uh, levels of glass on the mask and so everything is transmitting. That can make things very, very sensitive and complex. And even high transmission above 6% also starts getting into places where you have uh, ghost assist feature printing and other problems that are not typical. And then in EUV, we have many more complications. I've listed a few, mass 3D, anamorphic imaging, there's flare, um, other things with um, long range and short range effects, which are not present in the standard immersion lithography, which need to be captured. And uh, ILT can help naturally capture those things during the solving. OK, so this is just showing a little bit about the typical steps for ILT, uh, the, just showing how we represent the mass. This is the synopsis way. There's other competitors which have slightly different ways. But they, most of them usually have some sort of pixel-based representation of the mask. Here we have a level set optimization where the mask edge is captured implicitly by a surface where you slice that surface at a height, say, of 0 that will show you where the mask edge is. And then we'll run some optimization, which will then move the surface around, which is in effect moving the mask shapes around and perhaps stretching it or creating new features and that sort of thing. So this would be the optimization and really the heart of the ILT uh, solution method. And what we can see here is that during this process, we have a lot of curvilinear shapes that are generated naturally. And so really, 
the type of mask which is at the heart of ILT is a curvilinear mask. And I can show you on the next slide, we have some steps showing how we go from the curvilinear to more manufacturable things. But what I want to say is that, and, and repeat, is that if we have a way to write the curvilinear mask or handle that or use that, it's actually a better solution for us and lithographically will be a, give a better answer. So there's a few things here on the manufacturability I'll touch on. One is the all-angle MRC. So traditionally, when we had the all-angle mask, this was only an intermediate piece. And what we needed to do was prepare it so that we could actually make some kind of a, a manufacturable Manhattan mask with strict MRC rules and all edges at 45 and 90 um, so, that, so that it could be written by a standard mask writing tool. And then it could go into fracture. So we had a lot of things in terms of trying to make up new ideas for having width and space rules applied to all angle and other kind of MRC checks which are traditionally done with DRC tools here but trying to apply them to an all angle tool. And so what we would do is do that, then do some Manhattanization and then eventually it would get fractured. The problem you can see is that as things get more complex and these stair steps get smaller, the number of shots can go way up. And I'm showing down here something from PMJ 2016 that New Flair showed, which is pretty clear right time uh, linear basically increase, which doesn't happen if you use a multi-beam writer. So, if we had some multi-beam tools which could be used effectively, we could certainly write these sort of things. And maybe we could even get back to writing something here, which is much farther upstream, which will reduce both the runtime of ILT and improve the litho performance of the ILT. OK, so now I'm going to cover a few ILT use cases that are currently being uh, used by our customers. So one of the first use cases, which is a little bit upstream from production, would be in the SMO and design exploration area. So here we show an example where you have some contact array where there's some X dimension, Y dimension of the contacts, Y pitch, and X pitch. So it's kind of a four-dimensional search over a pattern. And what we would want to do is not only understand what is design variations work well, but also what sources go with them. And the thing is, once you have unknown sources and you're kind of stretching your design rules, it's hard to do an optimization procedure which is thorough, which can study all the variations of these things with some pre-computed rule table. Because like I showed in the beginning, the assist feature placement is really dependent on the source. So if you're actually searching over the source, you need something to help you automatically get those assist feature placements. So this kind of uh, exploration area is a really good use case for ILT. And then we would go and study over all the different variables. We'd make a bunch of plots and look like which ones are performing best and get some idea of what design space and source space would work well. And then as a byproduct, you can also get some mask uh, idea for or how the mask looks, but in general, you're really searching over the source and the design. Okay, so then a little bit farther upstream towards production, we would have something where we could implement what we call cell level ILT. So this is an example where we're really using some repetition finding on a repeated array to find some small pieces which are repeated and which are very critical to the customer and do very aggressive ILT. And because we have uh, found a lot of symmetry and repetition here, we will know that we can get the solution quickly, the solution will be symmetric, and we can also have it run for a little bit longer on a per area basis to get an aggressive solution. So this is something to really squeeze out a lot of depth of focus or process window performance on a repeated area that we have customers using. Okay, the next one is hotspot fixing. So this could be applied to both memory and logic. We have an example here of a contact, stretch contact in the middle, which is a little bit isolated and a little bit weaker, which needs some extra assist feature handling. And what we're showing around here is how we can blend the aggressive ILT solution in with the traditional OPC and RBF solution. So this is another thing which is very useful because if you only have a few hotspots, you don't need to worry as much about the total impact to your th uh, throughput or runtime because it will, it will only take a much smaller amount of time to run these uh, critical areas versus running ILT everywhere. Okay, and here's an example of something which is kind of a hybrid solution which mixes ILT used as kind of a rule generator for 
uh, rule-based assist features. So what we will have is we'll take some test patterns here. We have like a contact. We're just shoving the X, showing where you're measuring. A 2D array and a 1D array. We'll run ILT and get some rules on those. And then we'll extract into some kind of a special rule table what are the assist feature uh, rules that would correspond with the ILT solution here. Then we can take that and apply it on a, a new random layout which doesn't necessarily have the same patterns you ran the tests on. And you get something which can be controlled for complexity here. We've, we've shown some octagons so it's not completely freeform, but it still has a lot of the uh, complexity and benefit that ILT uh, would have. But it has a little bit of uh, complexity control and also has a lot faster runtime because once you run here, you're not actually running ILT, you're just running a rule-based placement. So it has a lot of the pluses of rule-based placement, but also some of the pluses of uh, running ILT. Last section I have here is about future extensions for ILT covering mainly DSA and EUV. All right, so the first thing I'll show is a small DSA example or a couple examples here. Here we have a kind of DSA-like thing where we have the template outline in pink here and then the actual goal of printed contacts in the dark uh, pink or red here, sort of spelling out synopsis in cartoon letters. So what ILT will be solving for is how to print the guide template here. And what we can see is that the mask that's produced here is somewhat complex, has a lot of merging of assist features and main features. It's very hard to tell exactly what is assist feature and main feature in some areas. And actually, there's not even that many distinct polygons on this whole thing. There's like one big polygon in the middle and a few extras. So this is not a typical type of OPC mask that you would get. And the reason is there's a lot of strange pitches and interactions here that you wouldn't normally have on a layout. You know, there's almost, between these things, there's perhaps some uniform pitch, but then there's a lot of other sort of forbidden pitches and intermediate pitches which are just showing up everywhere here. And so it really is hard to get this thing with the standard DRC type tool because also a lot of the pitches are on diagonals or kind of strange angles that wouldn't be in a normal layout. Okay, the second example, this is a little bit similar to the design exploration I showed on a previous slide. This is showing for DSA doublets, we wanted to, dis to discover like what is the best uh, design in terms of the pitch in this direction, in the skew in this direction for a pair of contacts to be printed with DSA. And so what we're showing here is one, there's a complex mask which has a lot of arbitrary angles to it. And we're also showing how if we tune different cost functions, ILT can naturally produce different solutions which could focus on either me for possible exposure, latitude, or depth of focus. Depending on what is most critical for your design, you can tune the ILT cost function and it will naturally adjust the solution to print a better uh, performance for that particular metric which you're interested in. Okay, so that was DSA and now for EUV, uh, we have some results and there's going to be more results shown at this uh, paper on March 2nd. And what we have here is a layout which is just kind of a three by three stretch contacts and they're pretty small. They are only, I think, about 16 nanometers wide. And so what we tested a nominal and plus minus defocus of 50 nanometers solution. And for the OPC solution, we just used some standard rules. But what you can see about the OPC solution is that the contact mask is a little bit off center. And this is because this was at the edge of the reticle for EUV. So there's some effects of shadowing or illumination angle which are not necessarily captured by the assist features but are certainly reflected in the OPC solution. But what you can see from ILT is there's definitely all that asymmetry because of the placement on the reticle is captured clearly and even you know there's some off diagonal type of assist feature growing which would be hard to uh, possibly capture in a rule-based assist feature rule table. And the solution here, the CD uh, for the defocus in both the X direction or the Y direction and the X direction is much better than was could be produced by the RBF and OPC. If you could perhaps tune the RBF to be like this, I think you could probably get a solution. But the problem is with all the complexity of all the reticle angles and everything, that might be somewhat difficult. And so ILT can naturally solve that for you. Okay, and here's another example where we took a small pattern of three diagonal contacts and then two contacts in the 
uh, corners here and kind of varied how those things were all placed in these boxes about 64 times in an array here and then did the OPC solution and did the ILCT solution and the context uh, dimensions are shown here. And so what we have on here is the results from that and what we can see is that on the right side here the nominal is pretty much on target for both the OPC and the ILT. There's a few places that are off target a little bit for the OPC. The ILT is in yellow. Um, and this is, this is just showing the kind of mask shapes. And then here what we're showing is the OPC process variance band minus the ILT. So you want to shrink the process variance band to be as close to zero as possible. And so what this means is that anything that's larger would mean OPC is doing worse. So here you can see that the improvement from ILT is somewhere around maybe uh, one to two nanometers on average. And you can see that the PV band for a lot of these contexts is around maybe three, four, five, or six nanometers. So that's a pretty big, around 20% you know, improvement, which is pretty consistent overall and maybe hard for OPC to adjust with unless it was able to get some much more complex assist features. So that's pretty much all the data I have to show, and I can just give a summary here. Um, we showed some uh, outline of ILT. We showed how it's being used currently in memory and logic areas in, in development. We noted how the shrinking mask rules, design CDs, and complex physical interactions are making ILT more attractive. We showed that curvilinear ILT is available and it produces the best results and if it can be written with newer techniques that would be something great for uh, using ILT and reducing the concern about mass complexity. And then also I talked a little bit about DSA and EUV uh, having issues that ILT can help solve in. Certainly with EUV because it's being introduced I guess so late it's already becoming just as difficult as maybe uh, 40 nanometer technology was for uh, DUV. So it's already at a point where the K1 is low and, and it's somewhat of a difficult problem as it is. So that's pretty much the end and thank you for attending.